guys, I want to welcome you to the weekly Wednesday for the Financial Freedom Newsletter, where every week, every Wednesday, we delve into something inspirational, motivational, something excerpt taken from the Financial Freedom Weekly Newsletter. Wherever you are, if you're listening on Spotify, on iTunes, Google, be sure to click the like, subscribe, share, comment. Without ado, let's get into the show. Welcome, everybody, to this week's podcast episode for the Financial Freedom Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Christopher Liu. And as you know, we talk about four different types of freedom, time, financial, location, health freedom. And in that light, I bring on the, the today's guest is Dr. Steve Perlman, and he dubs himself as the Steve Jobs of critical thinking, which is really interesting. So I'm always interested in people doing things on the cutting edge. And so today we're going to be talking about critical thinking, uh, thinking for yourself, you know, our modern, modern school education system, and it's going to be a great conversation. So Steve, welcome. Thanks so much for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Quick question. So why do you dub yourself as the Steve Jobs of critical thinking? Oh, well, that was actually a moniker given to me by somebody else. Uh, but <laughs> I'm happy to wear it. If, the reason is that what I've done is developed a particularly innovative way of approaching the instruction of critical thinking that is actually works from the, how the brain naturally works and thinks and builds outward from that and refines that rather than trying to impose ideas of external logic and so forth onto the brain. So it's really a very innovative way to go about it. Yeah. Uh, and how did you get how did you get started on this? Um, like this idea? Was it something that you encountered during your training or um, tell us more? I wish it was something someone trained me in because my life would have been better off for it. But no, uh, I, you know, I was in academia for 30 years, over 30 years teaching writing and critical thinking. But um, and that pursuit was a dedicated one. But it really wasn't until about 2011 when I was challenged by a university to raise critical thinking outcomes across the entire university. And that seems like something that all universities should obviously be doing, but they're not. And in fact, the outcomes in academia around critical thinking are fairly dismal. Around 5% of college students are shown to be proficient in critical thinking. It depends upon the study, of course. And so in that process of spending a decade researching critical thinking with the need to actually produce verifiable, measurable results out of it, we had to look at ways that weren't being done yet because none of the ways that were in operation really had produced any meaningful successes. So we found we went way back into the neuroscience and really started to find out some of our primal mechanisms for critical thinking and how we've built on those as human beings. Yeah. Um, so I have a, you know, I have a really interesting question is, um, you know, they call our school system, you know, modern, but it's actually, you know, designed for the 1950s and for, you know, way back when, you know, uh, do you think this is by design or is it some, is it just, they, they can't keep, 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 keep up with society? What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's a great question because our school system is entirely archaic. In fact, dating back really much farther into the 1800s or so forth. And the reason is that at a certain point in time, it made sense that knowledge was the greatest commodity that one could have. And it was very scarce. So if you were a doctor at that time, you knew everything there was to know about medicine right? And there was not a lot of new information about medicine coming out. So you would go to medical school for the rare few who did it and be lectured to by someone who knew everything there was to know and books were very scarce or or if, if existing at all. So we had an educational format that was built on, you know, one person as the progenitor of knowledge, passing that knowledge on to a group of other people. Uh, then around the turn of the century, what happened was we went into the, or the previous century, we went into the factory model with the industrial revolution and two things happened. One, we designed our schools to be like factories where we move students along on conveyor belts through different grades and classes, which is absurd. Okay. And the second thing is that, and this is very sad, a conscious decision was made by the secretary of education at that time 
that since most Americans would spend their days working in factories doing menial labor, that we didn't want an educational system that inspired their hopes and dreams. Mm -hmm. We wanted one that weeded people out. It's the only the very smartest ones in a very narrow band could move forward and the rest had to get used to responding to the bell, sitting still and following orders mm -hmm. because that's what their factory life was going to be. And it's, it's the damage to that that's been done in our society uh, since that is incalculable. The amount of money, the amount of time, the amount of money and the amount of minds that have been put to waste because of that. It's it's a I think it's one of the greatest unspoken tragedies of the modern age. So, yeah, we are way outdated and there are so many better ways for us to approach education. But unfortunately, they have not taken root in our educational system. And I want to say this, by the way, very importantly. Let's support our educators. I have worked with thousands of educators, and they are good people who want to do the right things by our students, but they're in a system that is not affording them that opportunity. Yeah, it seems like when you look around, like all of these, like, for example, um, healthcare, education, or financial system, political system, transportation, everything is like, just that like, everything is just so, it doesn't work anymore. It's like, and it's like, um, which is really frustrating, but, you know, at the same time, you know, there's a lot of opportunity. What, what does, um, one thing is what's interesting is, um, how does the, how does your, you have, you founded the critical thinking Institute and I know you have, um, you know, teaching kids and how to think critically and how that applies to real world decision. Give us a, you know, a taste and flavor of what's, what you have. We actually have two programs, one's for kids and teens, and that's sort of an animated program. And it's really for adults too, because if you're an adult who really just loves cartoons, you're going to get the same content from that essentially as you're going to get from our program for teens and adults. And they're just delivered in some different formats and they emphasize some things a little bit differently, but essentially you're getting the same training through them. And they are year long experiences, 50 classes, uh, just a few minutes a week on critical thinking, but what they're doing is really teaching everyone essentially an operating manual for your own brain. And so how to recognize what does our brain do when we think? Why does it do it? What are the good things that it does? Because we all have good things that our brain does when it thinks. And we all have bad things that our brain does when it thinks that actually suppress or interfere with good reasoning. And those are for survival purposes that no longer really function in the modern time. But, you know, our brains don't know that we're in a modern time yet. They haven't evolved that far. So we have these sort of outdated mechanisms for survival that interfere with uh, how we go about thinking. These are tribalistic things or survivalist things in our brains. And we're going to learn all of that and more as it applies to everything you do in life, because this is a naturalistic system for critical thinking. It applies to every single thing you do from the decisions you make in life to reading and writing to your career and so forth. And I, I think I should mention that research has shown, this is fascinating, when it comes to making the best real life decisions, intelligence is not the determining factor. It's a factor, but it's not the biggest determining factor. And the biggest determining factor is critical thinking skills. But then you have to ask yourself, how many people have really been trained in ways to think and operate their brains better? And it's uh, almost a non-existent percentage of our population. And, and the fact that we might have doctors listening doesn't mean that they have been either very smart people and excellent doctors and good reasoning within the field of medicine, but not the same thing as an overall operating manual for the brain. So that's what we're trying to do with the Critical Thinking Institute and both programs, the kids program and the adult program will both be up and running right at the start of January, early in January, 2023. Um, what, for example, um, you know, critical thinking is, which is interesting because, um, you know, creativity and, um, like imagining and all these really in esoteric components are really important in today's society. But, and then how does, um, how do, how can critical thinking skills help children with leadership? That's a great question. And I think, you know, creativity and innovation are all part of critical thinking. Because in order to innovate something, we have to, in certain way, be able to understand what exists and what's wrong or what's incomplete 
about what exists. And then we have to know how to be able to transcend that idea into a bigger idea or a better idea, right? How to break a new paradigm. That's critical thinking. In terms of leadership, can you think of any ways in which critical thinking wouldn't apply to being a good leader? And that not only applies to how well we can reason through the problems we face as leaders independently, but can we learn how to inspire others to think better as well? And one of the things that we, once you learn our methods, once people learn what we do, they can share that and lead a discussion with a group in how to do that. And there are all kinds of little tips and tricks for how to go about running better groups or managing a team and so forth to allow space for critical thinking. And for example, I'll just give you one quick little idea here, right? There's so much evidence around leadership and the extent that it's important to simply afford our team an open-ended question instead of presenting them with an idea. So if, let's say you go to a team and you say, hey, I've got this idea. What do you think about it? That's the wrong way to approach it because you've A, given them an idea to work against. You've already planted a seed in their head, right? And so you've stopped a lot of their thinking process right there. Instead, if you just go in and say, look, we've got this problem. Let me get some ideas from you first, and then you can work your way down the road into what your idea is. Well, you can make that part of the mix. Now you're stimulating thinking and actually elevating the amount of brain function that's going on in that discourse. So, so many things like that. And that's one example out of a thousand examples applied to how we lead through critical thinking. Do you have to, another question is, um, that I had was, uh, you know, if you're you, like, for example, decision-making and, um, like judgment, critical thinking, does it take discipline to, um, develop that? Is it something that's innate? Uh, what does it have to do with critical thinking? It's both. It, I mean, you know, we all have a capacity to think to some degree, you know, some of us more than others. And I'm sure all of your listeners know some people who think they don't have much of a capacity to think very critically at all or much at all, uh, but it varies. And the way I like to explain it is like this, you know, just about everyone has some capacity to run, right? And that's an innate capacity in us uh, for most of us to be able to run. That's great, right? And so there are going to be people who are naturally faster and there are going to be people who are naturally slower at running. But anyone can train to be a better runner. And in training to be a better runner, will always be faster and be able to run longer distances than they would have been if they didn't train it. You know, now I'll be honest with you. I could have trained running from the time I was a little kid as hard as I would. I was never would be fast as Usain Bolt, right? None of us would be probably, right? But could I have been a lot faster than I would have been otherwise? Could I be faster than most people if I really worked at running? Yeah, absolutely, right? Thinking is the same way. We have an innate ability to think. It's natural. We all have it to a certain degree, some more than others, right? But we all have it to a certain degree. But it's a skill that we can then understand and amplify it ourselves if we practice it. Uh, so I don't know if disciplined is the right word. That's part of it, I guess. I think it's just more practice. Understanding what it is our brain does, being self-aware of it, and then learning to maximize those good aspects of our brain function. Yeah, yeah. very fascinating discussion. Um you know, we need, uh, especially in the information age and with the metaverse coming and Web3, um, you know, these, and especially with um, artificial intelligence, they're basically going to um, be the infrastructure for very simple, but that will allow us to do more complex humanist, humanistic tasks. How many, uh, and critical thinking is going to be really important. So, um, how do people follow you, contact you, visit your, web, visit your website, et cetera? I love this question so much because, you know, the one thing that I think is going to be the hardest thing for AI to replace is thinking, right? Is developing new ideas, is innovating and so forth. So it's such an important question. You can find me at uh, the ctinstitute.com. That's the critical thinking institute at the ctinstitute.com. And you can also follow me on on uh twitter and so forth and instagram you can find me on facebook at the critical thinking institute you can find me on instagram at the ct institute and so on and so forth but check out the ctinstitute.com you can learn a lot more about what we do and the science behind it there yeah so for all the listeners out there um 
fantastic discussion. I hope you got some really gems, especially this is a very important skill to have in, in the next 20, 30 years. Be sure all of uh, Steve's resources will be in the links in show notes. Be sure to follow him on Instagram and Twitter, his website. And he's actually, if you go to the, C, the CT Institute, he's got a, a preview of the first three videos for his program. So be sure to check that out. And again, thanks so much. Um, what a fantastic discussion. I'm always passionate about education and thanks so much for a great discussion. Thanks for having me. It's been such a pleasure. I hope you really enjoyed that wonderful, inspirational, motivational piece. Again, if you, wherever you are listening, if you liked it, be sure to like, comment, share subscribe we're on everywhere spotify itunes google amazon audible and without much ado be sure to thank this show's sponsors and we'll see you next week